Welcome everybody to today's webinar, How to Identify the Gift of Evangelism. Our presenters today are Dr. Larry Moyer, founder and CEO of Avantel, and President David Souther. You all are in for some great content today as we pull back the mystery on what is the gift of evangelism. There just seems to be a lot of mystery shrouding on do I have it, does somebody I know have it, and we're going to help clear that up today. So with that, let's look at today's agenda. The first thing we're going to talk about is the meaning of the word evangelist. It's often overlooked in scripture. Where does this word come from? Where is it used? And how do we come up with this meaning that we use today? And secondly, we're going to look at the six keys to help identify the gift. And lastly, we want to look at what does and does not characterize the gift of evangelism. I think that's a, a very critical part of today's discussion, so definitely stay tuned for that. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our president, David Souther. Let's kick off the webinar with a poll question. When you hear the word evangelist, what immediately comes to mind? Now, don't stop and think about it. Just when you hear that word evangelist, what do you picture in your mind? Is it a person who draws a large following? Is it a person with a charismatic personality? Is it a person who is never afraid to share Christ? Or a person who is involved in vocational Christian ministry, someone where this is their full-time vocational job? So how are we looking, Brock, on the on the results here? Well, we're gonna close the poll in about five seconds. So if, you, if somebody hasn't voted, please jump in and vote now. We have one clearly leading the pack, and so definitely want to get everybody voting. And we'll go ahead and close this down. Um, and the winner by far is a person who is never afraid to share Christ. Seventy-five percent of those attending. Um, what was number two? Uh, number two is really far behind, but it was a person with a charismatic personality. And I would say that uh, th th those two go together somewhat. Because you think of that persuasive person who has no fear, who, who is up sharing the gospel. But, you know, while we're here is to discuss the biblical meaning of the word evangelist. And who better to bring that to us than an actual evangelist, Larry Moyer. So, Larry, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I think a good place to start when we talk about the gift of evangelism is just what you mentioned, David, and that is let's define the meaning of the word evangelist. Well, it's interesting to me, the word evangelist occurs three times in New Testament. One time is Acts 21.8. Paul's companions departed, came to Caesarea, and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. It's interesting that he is the only evangelist mentioned in the New Testament. He preached in Samaria, shared Christ with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, and then continued a traveling ministry along the southern coast of Palestine. He's the only evangelist mentioned in the New Testament. A second place is 2 Timothy 4, 5, where Paul said to Timothy, do the work of evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And if there's any verse of scripture that tells any Christian worker Regards of what kind of work you're in, do you need to do the work of evangelist? It's 2 Timothy 4 5. Because Paul talked to Timothy, a gifted pastor, teacher, non evangelist, but he says, do the work of evangelist. And then the third place is Ephesians 4 11, where it says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists. And the clear meaning of Ephesians 4 11 is, that God has given gifted people to church as evangelists and has gifted them accordingly. But those are the three places found, Acts 21, 8, 2 Timothy 4, 5, and Ephesians 4, 11. Now, with that in mind, what we ought to do next is define what is actually the gift. We've talked about where the word's found. Now, what are how you define the gift of evangelism? Well, evangelism means the ability to communicate the gospel to non-believers. You get that from the Greek word evangel, that means good news. Evangelize, therefore, means announce good news. And evangelist is one who announces good news. So if all we had was the Greek word, we would know it's the ability to communicate the gospel to unbelievers. But that's not the only thing we have. Not only do we have the word, we also have Ephesians 4.12, where it makes it very clear 
the gift is also to equip believers. Because in Ephesians 4, 12, it says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that means that the gift of evangelism involves not only declaring the gospel to non-Christians, but communicating the gospel by equipping the believer to evangelize. So as I often say, it's a gift with two prongs. One is a reaching prong to unbelievers, and the other is an equipping prong to believers. Larry, got a, got a question here. Um, if a person has the gift of evangelism, is it biblically proper to say that they are an evangelist? I think if he has the gift of evangelism, you can properly say he's an evangelist because he's to announce the gospel to non-Christians and equip the believers. Now, the problem is we often think of a profession and we all think of a gift instead of a profession because you can have the be, first could be called evangelist and be serving God as a plumber, as a carpenter. But I think you could clearly say he's evangelist. Gotcha. Now, with, with that in mind, when I talk about declaring the gospel with non-Christians, equipping the believers of evangelism, again, it's a gift with two problems. One's the non-Christians and one's the believers. Evangelizing the non-Christians, equipping the believers. I think, though, the first part of that gift is the predominant one, declaring the gospel with non-Christians. Because you cannot equip believers if you are not doing it yourself. And therefore, it all has two problems. I think the first prong is a predominant part of the gift because in order to equip others, he has to be a person who's doing it himself. Now, next thing that would be very helpful is six keys to help identify the gift of evangelism. A number of years ago, several of us who are respected as having the gift of evangelism sat down, we put our heads together, and we said to ourselves, what characterizes people with that gift? not only from our own experience, but observing others with the gift. And together, we as a small group came up with six things that we all agreed on that characterizes the gift of evangelism. Now, these are not in any particular order, but the first one I would address is the ability to communicate with non-Christians. I think that's one of the first characteristics, the ability to communicate with non-Christians. And I, with that, I've mentioned three things. Because they have the ability to understand what non-Christians are thinking and asking, they say things in a way that communicates to them. Yeah, I've had people who I'm talking to about Christ say, I really feel like you understand me. And it's because I'm saying things in a way that communicates to them, and that's part of the, what characterizes the gift. And not only that, but they know what someone is thinking, not just what they're saying, and that's why they can communicate so well to them. I often think of a man that I was speaking to one time, and he said to me, my problem is I, I just don't think there's a heaven or a hell. Well, that did not fit anything that we had just talked about. And so I said to them, I don't think that's your problem. I think your problem is that everything you've been exposed to in Christianity has been boring. Boring preachers and boring sermons and boring Christians and boring songs. So you're afraid to come to Christ and be hello boredom and goodbye happiness. He said, you know, that's really my problem. I'm really convinced that there is a heaven or hell. I just, it's all been so boring to me. Well, I told him how he had the wrong perspective, changed his thinking, and there that night he trusted Christ. Now, there have been times my wife or somebody else had been with me during those times, and they've said, how did you know that's what they were thinking? Well, I don't know what to tell them other than I just think it's part of the gift that they know what someone is thinking, not just what they're saying. And a third thing I would add in terms of communicating with non-Christians, he or she can talk their language. Uh, that's why even referring to something like a hymn, I call it a song. Referring to a verse, I say non-Christians, a sentence in the Bible, because that's what they say. And when I talk to non-Christians, I say, sometimes you feel like God could care less. He said, that's exactly how I feel. And I say it in a way, language they use and understand. But I think that's part of the gift, and that's why they communicate so well with non-Christians. All right, Larry, uh, two quick questions. One is for that second bullet where you say they know what they are thinking, not just what they are saying. You know, I've seen this at work 
uh, with you in particular, where a person may bring up an objection in evangelism, and you seem to intuitively know that the issue they're bringing up is not the central issue, there's some underlying issue, and, and you navigate the conversation toward that issue, is this uh, not only knowing what they're thinking, not only knowing what they're saying, but you know what they're thinking, is this something that is learned through experience, or is this part of the intuition that comes from the gift? I would put the intuition first, and then I would say it is enhanced by experience. I would definitely say the intuition first, that's also enhanced by experience. I said to a man not too long ago, I said, I think your real problem is that you seem to think you're too big a sinner for God to save. He said, you know, you're probably right. That's probably my bigger problem. And I would say that came from intuition first, but then also experience, because I've talked to people who have that same difficulty. Thank you, Larry. Second question, when you say he or she talks their language, you know, I'm picturing you need to be around non-Christians to, to stay up to date on, you know, the way many talk, the cadence, the uh, issues they're bringing up. What are those things, in addition to spending time with non-Christians, that you read or watch to kind of keep you into that, to kind of keep you into that worldview? Uh, spending time with them is the most. Uh, one time I spoke to a man who did not know the Lord. I said, if God spoke to somebody about you, what do you think he'd say? And I'll never forget the guy looking at me and say, Larry, God does not curse. And what he meant by that is, I mean, God thinks of me, he feels like cursing. I mean, that's pretty strong, but that's how the guy actually felt. But when you hear them say that strong a language, uh, I've heard of people who have contacted Z from somebody else, and they said, I wish you were alive today, I'd love to kill him. Well, that's not the way you and I would say it, but that's the way they say it. But then spending time with them is a key. But then also, I read anything I can, whether it's a news magazine, a newspaper, the news on the internet, and I really try to watch the news. And what I'm watching for often is the way people are saying things, the phrase they're using, the terminology they use. That's awfully important. Now, a second thing characterizes the gift, and all these we could spend a lot more time on if we had, and particularly this one, the enjoyment of conversations with non-Christians. When those who are affecting evangelism are around unbelievers, two things happen. And they many times enjoy being around unbelievers, sometimes more than believers. I even mentioned to a professor, a friend of mine one time in a seminary, that there are actually times I enjoy being around unbelievers more than believers. And I think it's for two reasons. They feel there are people they understand. I understand these people. I know where they're coming from. I know what they're thinking. But secondly, they afford them the opportunity to exercise their gift because they see an opportunity to turn a conversation to spiritual things. And that affords them the opportunity to exercise their gift. And that's why they so enjoy being around unbelievers, even to the point that they're also frustrated at times if they don't have contact with unbelievers. One time I knew of a person on a church staff that was strongly gifted in evangelism, and they were increasingly giving him administrative work that took him away from contact with unbelievers. And I said to this supervising person, I said, if you don't are careful, you're going to lose him because he just is getting so frustrated because he has no time with unbelievers. Unfortunately, they did not heed my advice. And a few months later, he resigned. And he said to me, I've just got to be around non-Christians. And I understand because I love my work here in the office. I love being with the staff, the greatest staff you can be with, in my opinion. But I really get excited driving down the beltway around Dallas, heading to the airport, and having another chance to have conversation with unbelievers both on the plane that I'm traveling in and also the engagement I'm getting to. In fact, people often remark about the many illustrations I use about witnessing on the plane. It's because I've traveled a lot, and that's one of my best opportunities. And I think planes are great opportunities, and I think one reason is that people feel insecure because if not something happens, they can't do a thing about it. And that's one reason I think people are often approachable on a plane. But when I sit down on an airplane, I do with the excitement of realizing, hopefully, I'll be able to say something to the person next to me. I have to confess that when I found out that believe, find out that believer person is a believer, there's often a sense of disappointment. I'm obviously glad he knows the Lord, 
by the same time, you can't save the saved. You can only save the unbeliever. And so, therefore, there's no chance to lead him to Christ because he's already come to Christ. There's always a bit of disappointment there because I you love being around unbelievers. Now, a third characteristic is the desire to motivate believers towards evangelism. Now, I say that again for several reasons. The gift of evangelism brings with an excitement, enthusiasm, often has a way of motivating believers. I cannot think of one person I've ever met that's actually gifted evangelism that does not have excitement, enthusiasm about them. And that can really motivate believers because enthusiasm is catching, contagious. A second reason thing about that is that many believers have felt called to a higher level of service as a result of hearing an evangelist. When Bill Graham, probably the one that people knew the best, was active in ministry and I was traveling, I heard many people say, every time I hear him, I feel like taking, living close to Christ or taking the world for Christ. And through his gift, he called them to a higher level of service. And then I think a third way that's effective in terms of motivating believers is believers are often captivated by their passion for reaching non-believers. As I've spoken in so many places across the world, I've had believers say, you know, as I listen to you, I really gained a little passion to talk to somebody I know about Christ. I'm going to see if I cannot make that happen next week. That's happened many, many times because they were captivated by my passion to reach the laws. And for that reason, the gift has a way of motivating believers. Now, a fourth thing characterizes the gift. They may be able to teach. Now, we always try to choose our words very carefully to communicate accurately. And there's two reasons I say may. One is, while well, definitely he can equip believers, he does not necessarily have to, have to teach to equip. He can simply do it by example. One time I was speaking in Louisiana, and a person came up to me after several days of sitting under my messages and said, I've learned so much from you about how to evangelize just by listening to you. Well, what's interesting, as I do now, but at that time I did not, I did not have any kind of seminar to train believers. I just was reaching the lost. And what they learned, they learned by example. Now, at the same time, there's a special ability to believe, teach believers how to evangelize as well. In other words, they capture by example. But then I think sometimes there's a special ability to trip, trip believers. Now, I think one reason by that is just that they're effective in teaching what they've done so much of. If I talk to somebody who's a plumber, they can teach me about plumbing because they've done so much of it. If I talk to a contractor, he can teach me very easily how to build a house because he's done it. Well, common sense says if a person has a gift of evangelism and evangelizes a lot, then they can teach you how to do it just because they've done it so much. And you don't have to necessarily have the gift of teaching. It's just you have the ability out of experience. When Dallas Seminary first invited me to come teach evangelism, I went to my mentor, Hattie Robinson, I said, I'm struggling because I don't feel I have the gift of teaching. I obviously have the gift of evangelism. He said, I don't think that's the issue. If you can evangelize what you do, then you can teach others how to do it. And that freed me up to walk in the classroom and teach because of teaching what I'd already done. And there may be a gift of teaching involved with some people, but you don't have to necessarily have the gift of teaching. He may be able to teach just because he's done so much. But the point is, they spend so much time with non-Christians, they're able to help believers relate to them because of the fact they've just spent so much time doing it. So they may be able to teach, and some would probably be stronger in teaching others how to do it, and some are. I know a person who was very effective in reaching certain people, but he wasn't nearly as effective in teaching others how to do it, although he could do it by himself. So the strength there may vary, but at the same time, there's often the ability to teach as well. Now, a fifth characteristic is a desire to communicate the gospel, and this is a big one. An important component of evangelism is developing a drive and enthusiasm to tell anybody and everybody the good news of Christ. Best proof I could give, I have made it a practice on a regular basis. When I'm around someone who has a gift of evangelism, I say to them, 
why do you have to evangelize? The number one response is, I don't know what to tell you. I just have to. I mean, that's what I enjoy the most. I understand. Because it's something you just got to do. There's that compulsion to tell everybody. The late Dr. Campbell Morgan, I don't have it in front of me, but made a statement that was one of the best I've ever read. And his statement was to the fact that someone with the gift has such a compulsion to tell everybody and anybody the good news. And he's exactly right. Now, with this, and this is developed, there's actually nothing in ministry that gives him quite the joy, satisfaction, that speaking to an unbeliever does. I had a chance just a few weeks ago to lead a man to Christ, and I was just thinking how much satisfaction that gave me. I couldn't wait to get back and tell the staff about it, tell my wife about it, and brought me a lot of satisfaction. Now, I would add a word of caution there too, though. One thing that concerns me is I have heard of angels do this. They stand before an audience or they talk to somebody one-to-one -one, they say, doesn't your heart just jump out of your body? <laughs> Don't you get overwhelmed with excitement telling somebody about Christ? I sincerely wish they would not do that. Because if you don't enjoy seeing unbeliever come to Christ, yes, you have a problem. If you don't enjoy as much as I do, that is no problem. Because I think that's part of what characterizes the gift. I would use the analogy that I have a friend who has a gift of giving. I've never seen anyone get so excited, so thrilled about giving the way he does. I enjoy giving, but I don't get nearly as thrilled about it as he does. Well, I would not want him to criticize me because I don't enjoy giving the way he does. And I am not going to criticize him because he does not enjoy evangelism as much as I do. I think that's part of what characterizes the gift, the desire to communicate the gospel. All right, Larry. Got a question here that, that involves this point, but it is a little, it, it refers back to something else you said regarding airplane evangelism. You know, with, with COVID, we seem to be coming out of COVID. Many of us will be traveling on airplanes more often. Tell me your strategy when you get on an airplane. Um, many of us are, you know, we're, we're dealing even with our own nerves getting on the airplane. It's a tense situation as people are getting loaded and, and you know, the fear of taking off and everything. Walk us briefly through your mindset, how you overcome that. You know, somebody may think, well, should I approach the person next to me? Um, but I want them approaching me about this stuff. Do and do others. What is your mindset when you're on an airplane? A great question. First of all, I always step on it with a prayer. The prayer is that God will direct me to any open door and give me boldness. The one prayer in my life God's never refused to answer, David, is that prayer for boldness. He give me boldness to talk to somebody on the plane that, I necessarily did not have, so I'm praying for boldness. The second thing is, if that person's open to me as an individual, I'm going to assume that's open door to the gospel, and I quickly pursue it and see how far I can get. Now, I would also mention with all that said, that COVID had presented some interesting difficulties because some people don't feel as free to talk because of COVID, but that is lessening up a bit now in our day. Also, what's interesting dynamic, the more crowded the plane, the less the opportunity. In other words, I find someone with an empty seat between us, in a situation with an empty seat between us, is a better opportunity than three people shoulder to shoulder. Because people like a little privacy, they want to talk a little bit in confidence. And I found my best opportunities come when the plane is not so crowded that the person next to me is at two seats away from me. But it's a thing where I simply ask God for the boldness to speak to him. And then I simply go as far as I can go because I find people that often are open to talking in a situation like that. I have a feeling you just you just kind of go with the flow when you actually break the ice and open the conversation. But are there any uh, one or two sentences or ways that you kind of break the ice there on the plane? Yes. The main reason way is the way we talk about talk to people about turning conversations. I try to really zero in on his family, his job, his background. And I talk about those three. Where are you going? What do you do? How long have you been doing it? I center a lot on the job of the three, the family job, the background. I center mostly on the job because he's flying to a job with his work or flying home from one. And then the whole time, I'm seeking some way to bridge into spiritual things. 
sometimes what's so interesting, David, all it takes is, it sounds like you do a lot of flying, I'll say a word of prayer for you because I appreciate praying for my safety. And so I do that as well. Uh, and I simply pray for safety. Now, sixth item to characterize a gift is the ability to lead someone towards a decision. Now, I think there are three reasons for that. There is effective evangelism, understand what non Christians are asking and saying, and often say things in a way they can relate to that brings them to a point of decision. I think of a man in the Air Force one time I was speaking to, and I really was able to help him understand eternal life is a free gift. God was not asking him to give up anything. God was asking him to receive something. But he realized that if he received God's free gift of eternal life and grew as a Christian, certain things would have to go. And he did not know if he wanted those things to go. So I drew two circles on a sheet of paper. Inside the one circle, I pulled heaven. Inside the other circle, I pulled girls and parties and alcohol, all the stuff he had mentioned. I said, no, I just want to be sure I'm clear on what you're saying. If I understand you, you're saying, I will give up this circle, heaven, for this circle. I remember though it happened yesterday. He said, may I think for a minute? I said, sure. He bowed his head to think, and I bowed my head and was praying for him. About two minutes later, he raised his head. He said, I'm ready. He trusted Christ is growing today. Well, I was able to bring him to a point of decision because I was saying things in a different way than he had heard him said before. You know, I think a second reason that it can lead people to decision is that God rewards his or her faithfulness in evangelizing because God rewards their faithfulness in using their gift. One time, a member of the Buddha Graham team, I heard him say, if there's 100 people in front of us and one of us presents the gospel, hardly anybody responds. Buddha Graham can get up and say half as much and a whole bunch of people respond. And he attributed that to the gift that Billy Graham had. I think he's right on. I think God honors the gift. And many times that's why they bring point people to a point of decision. And then the third reason I would give is because they speak to more unbelievers than many do, they see more results. I mean, it's simply a numerical thing. The more people you talk to, the more people are going to see respond. And since they speak to the most, that's why often they see the most people respond. Now, I would want to add a note before we continue, and that is that the gift alone does not guarantee success. Success in reaping, bringing people to a point of decision, depends on a number of things, such as development of the gift and circumstances. Let me give you an example of each. Development of the gift. Men came to me a number of years ago. He said, I love to evangelize. I think that's my gift. I sure cry just about every day. I've never seen anybody come to Christ. I said, you really have to be kidding. He said, no. He said, I've never, Larry, seen anybody come to Christ. I said, okay, I'm a non-Christian. Talk to me. Well, at the end of the conversation, what he was asking me to do was so confusing, I didn't understand it. I said, if I don't understand what you're asking me to do, can you imagine how confused a non-Christian is? I told him how to correct that. And about a week or two later, he wrote to me and he said, I just saw my first person come to Christ. Now, that was the bump of the gift. And then when it comes to circumstances, I would go back to what the Bible calls the condition of the soil. And for example, one time in Iowa, I spoke to so many people about Christ. Now, one person responded. A week later, I was in Del Rio, Texas. And everyone I spoke to, just about everyone, so responded. The pastor's wife said to me, do you ever not lead anybody to Christ? Because almost everyone I spoke to responded. All that was a condition of the soil. Now, what's interesting is several months later, I got a letter about how many people in Iowa that had come to Christ that I'd witnessed to and not seen true on the spot. So you got to be careful how far you carry that principle of truth and reaping because it depends on the development of the gift and then also the circumstances. Thank you, Larry. That leads to our second poll question. Which of these areas resonate with you the most right now? Is it enjoying time with non-believers, motivating believers toward evangelism, teaching believers a desire to communicate the gospel, or the ability to lead someone toward a decision? 
So results are still coming in, Larry, and, and you know, these are great principles, but I, I'm very interested to see how this is going to end up here. All right, we'll bring it to a close, and it looks like a desire to communicate the gospel yep. is, is number one with uh, the ability to lead someone toward a decision. Uh, pretty far behind it, but, but still uh, number two in enjoying time with non-believers is, is driving out the top three. Yeah, and that, that's exciting to hear. I mean, uh, we need more people than ever with that desire to communicate the gospel with the opportunities that are out there given all the circumstances in our world. Larry, you've done an excellent job bringing these principles, but I know this whole idea and gift of an evangelist also brings some misconceptions. So can you walk us through what doesn't necessarily characterize the gift? Okay, we talked about what does, now what doesn't. And I would say three things, all of which are so equally important. Now, number one, it's not confined to particular gender. I think often when people think of evangelists, they think of a male, and it may be because they've heard of evangelists like Billy Graham, Louise Plow, and others. Uh, they think of myself, and they think of a man. But you have to bear in mind, it's not confined to gender. That I have met women in traveling that are so gifted in evangelism. In fact, my mentor here in Dallas, well, not my mentor, my accountability partner, my accountability partner here in Dallas, his wife feels she has a gift of evangelism, and I would agree, and her husband agrees. And it's not confined to particular gender. All right, Larry. Uh, just want your opinion here, and uh, I, I know you'll be candid with us. Is it in your opinion that the churches that you work with, do you feel like they are fully utilizing women in the area of evangelists? And if so, why? If not, why? Uh, emphatic no. They're not fully using women. And two reasons. One, they're not fully using evangelists. <laughs> Period. Uh, male or female, that often they're not fully using those with the gift of evangelism in their congregation, and particularly women. And I think it's because many times they don't think of women having the gift. And again, I have known, I think of one right now that uh, is uh, I've talked to from time to time, and she is very gifted in evangelism and is as consistent as any man would be that has the same gift. Absolutely, and I can think of one particular couple that visited our offices a couple of years ago. They were missionaries in East Asia, and they came in, and, you know, the ministry was under his name, and he began talking, and his wife was there, and I began to talk to them how we could help them in evangelism, and after about 60 seconds, it became very apparent that, that he, was, uh, he, he was lost in thought about some other issue, but she was hanging on my every word, and I wound up talking to her more than him. And I feel like she had the gift, and he didn't. Yes, that's a good example. Um, now, a second thing I would say did not characterize a gift is it's not confined to particular personality type. Have to be very careful not to confuse personality with gift. I think most people with gift are extroverts. But interesting enough, I've never exactly been called an extrovert. In fact, I've had people say to my wife, Larry strikes me being a little bit bashful. And there are times I have struck people that way. But I don't think the issue is personality. I think the issue is the gift. There are people that would, would strike you as being very timid or something. And I can tell you they're leading many people to Christ. So don't lock it into a particular personality. Most are extroverts. But don't think of being extrovert. Think of simply having the gift because that can come through di different personalities. And then if I only talk about one thing that does not characterize a gift, it'd be the third one, that the absence of fear does not guarantee the gift. People think the presence of fear is the absence of gift. That is not true. Any gift advantage would tell you every single one of us have time we're afraid, Larry Moore included. And the presence of fear does not mean the absence of gift. One time at a dinner conversation, there were about probably four or six of us at the table. A woman said to me, sometimes I think I have the gift of evangelism, but there are times I'm afraid, so apparently I don't. I said, no, wait, hold everything. If you're telling me there are times you're afraid, that means you might have the gift. Because that's one thing characterizes a gift. It's the presence of fear, not the absence of fear. Now, let's talk about another area, and that's strength within the gift. Now, all this, I think, is a gift of evangelism. But I think there's strength within that gift, and sometimes it's not only because it's been Holy Spirit given, 
but also because that's where they spend most of their experience. For example, I think there's a strength in personal evangelism. I have a friend here in Dallas that is very strong in one-to-one -one evangelism. I can say I've learned something from myself. He's not nearly strong when he gets behind the pulpit to speak. I think it's strength in personal evangelism. Then there's a strength in evangelistic speaking. I've seen God in kindness I don't deserve use me to lead many, many people to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. But I've always sensed the greatest gift when I get behind a pulpit having developed the message targeting unbelievers. I think there's strength in evangelistic speaking. Then there's strength in training for evangelism. A person one time went through our training program. I said to him, I think you have gift in evangelism. I think particularly strong though in training others. He said, I would agree. I recommend him to a church as a minister of evangelism. And he had a very effective ministry training others. And then a fourth strength is your strength in writing. Gift of evangelism is strength in writing. Years ago when Francis Schaefer was alive, I was teaching at the seminary, out of seminary. I made the comment, I think Francis Schaefer has a gift of evangelism and a particular strength in expressing it through writing. A person came up to me afterwards and said, Larry, would you believe I've heard Francis Schaefer say that? He thinks he has a gift of evangelism and ability to express it in writing. Many feel that probably C.S. Lewis had that gift, and I would tend to agree, a gift of evangelism and ability to express it in writing because he said things that minister deeply to non-Christians. Now, something that's worth us really uh, coming to a close on is how you discover your gift. How you discover the gift of evangelism. I would say there's two ways. It's a two ways you discover any gift. And I think, first of all, experience. Serve the Lord however, wherever you can. Allowing God to use your experiences to help you discover where your gift is. It's been said God directs a moving object I think a better way to say it is God directs an obedient object. When you're obedient, God shows you where your gift is and it's therefore you just get experience. Be faithful doing what you know to do. And then exposure. Exposure to God in men and women who serve alongside of you and can say, I think you have the gift of evangelism. I served in two pastors while I was going to uh, seminary where I had the full responsibility for the summer. And God used godly men and women to say to me, I think God's given you gift in evangelism. Experience exposure is a big help. Quick question, Larry. I want to get your opinion on this. Uh, regarding spiritual gift test that we know some churches give, it's a survey of questions, and then based upon the answers, uh, you kind of tabulate and figure out what gifts you have according to that test, or you may find them online. What's your opinion of those in the role of helping someone discover if they have the gift of evangelism? I've taken two of them myself and found them very helpful. Interesting enough, they confirm my gift. Now, at the same time, having said that, though, I would stress the importance of exposure and experience. Don't rely upon the test. Tests are on paper. They can be wrong. They can be right. I think they can be helpful. But don't, by any means, use that alone. Instead, you need experience exposure because there's nothing like that live experience. So what you're saying is in order to figure out if you have the gift of evangelism, you need to start doing evangelism and then uh, just monitor it as you go. And you might find out you have the gift. You might find out, as some of my friends found out, they did not have the gift. They simply had a love for the loss. Mm -hmm. And so it could come out either way, but experience and exposure in terms of finding your gift and finding if you have a gift of evangelism as well as any gift, I think cannot be substituted for anything. So if you find out you don't have the gift, that doesn't let you off the hook, right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and that brings us to our conclusion. And we would say three things. All disciples are responsible to evangelize, some of special ability. If you say, I want to be a disciple of Christ, follow him. The first thing you taught disciples, Matthew 419 was, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So that means you have a responsibility to evangelize. But then that special ability. Now, I think the gift can be defined as a special ability to communicate the gospel to believers, equip the believers to evangelize. Again, a gift with two prongs. So one's to the unbelievers communicating the gospel, the other's equipping believers to communicate the gospel. And it's a special ability to communicate the gospel to unbelievers and equip believers to evangelize. Now, with that said, always keep in mind, the gift of evangelism is not required to evangelize. Simply be faithful and God will teach you as you go. Don't say, 
you know, God, once I learn how to do this, I'll evangelize. Set the evangelize and let God teach you as you go. And you don't have the gift, have the gift in order to evangelize. There are people I know with a strong gift in other areas. I would use my own dear wife as an example. She's strongly gifted with the gift of mercy. Yet she uses every opportunity she can to talk to lost about Christ. It has been exciting to see how much she has grown in evangelism. Yet she clearly does not have the gift and does not have to have it. And has led women to Christ even within the last few years uh, by just being faithful and sharing the gospel. You don't have the gift. Just evangelize, 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 keep evangelizing. I love the repetition, Larry, something you're very well known for. Uh, this leads to our final poll question, and, and I'm not even going to uh, venture into a guess on this one, but we want to know this. How has this webinar helped you the most? Uh, the answers are, it's confirmed my gift of evangelism. In other words, uh, you may have taken this webinar, it just co continues to solidify the fact that you know you have the gift of evangelism. Number two, hey, it's made me realize I may have the gift. You may have been close to it or thinking that's not for me, but after listening to the webinar, you're like, yeah, I may have this. Third, it's helped me recognize the gift in others uh, so that you can come along and encourage them. Or finally, it's shown me how gifted evangelists may help me. Brock, are we leaning a certain way here? We are definitely leaning uh, a certain way. There's a there's a second one that's, that's catching up to it, though. It's a, a little bit of a horse race. So uh, if you haven't voted, jump in there and vote. We will close that down. So the number one answer was, it has shown me how gifted evangelists uh, may uh, help me. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, Larry, I know this 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 stirs your heart because this is one of the reasons that you founded this ministry is to not only be an evangelist but help other people do evangelism. I mean, isn't that one of the reasons you founded it? I've said in speaking at conventions of church leaders, if you have someone with the gift of evangelism in your church, remember, male or female, if you have someone with the gift of evangelism in your church. Thank God for them, use them, and let them help you. All right, Brock, I think it's time for some Q&A. It is time for some question and answers. We have several uh, that have come in, and the first one here uh, says, my dominant gift is teaching, but I love to see people accept Jesus Christ and get saved. As an evangelist, how do we share the gospel? If you have the gift of teaching, you all consider two things. First of all, how can I teach others evangelism? I mean, teaching does not refer to a particular subject matter. It refers to gift. So how can I teach others evangelism? You could use some of our own material to teach. Uh, you could become, you can tell an instructor, but you could teach others how to do it. And secondly, ask yourself the question, probably a lot of your teaching is around unbelievers, is around believers. How am I having exposure to non-Christians with whom I can share the gospel? Evangelism requires contact. And so how, what opportunities I have, where am I around unbelievers? I can share the gospel with them. Because many times when you get to teaching, it's predominantly used toward believers. So how can I have uh, opportunity to be around nine Christians that I can in turn be able to share the gospel with them? And, and Larry, I've heard several gifted teachers weave the gospel in through their, uh, through their teaching. The Che Garner McGee would be one through the Bible radio has done it for years. And I guarantee you every other broadcast, he's weaving the gospel. Yes. In fact, a man by the name of Dr. Stan Toussaint who has gone to be with the Lord, but he never closed a lesson in teaching without giving opportunity for anyone there who did not know Christ to come to him. I never once heard him close a lesson in teaching without giving opportunity for the gospel. Yeah. And I have another question here. It's, it's uh, actually from the same person just asking, you know, we were taught to keep to walk people through the Romans road. Is this right? I think any method, those consistent have a basic method. And I tell people in traveling to almost every state over 60 foreign locations, I've not met a believer who's consistent. There's not a basic method. Come into it differently, come out of it differently, but you have a basic method to use. And therefore, if it's a Romans road, whatever it is you like to use, why the point is master a method. If you have a method, master, master, master some method. 
and therefore it'll make you more consistent. Yeah, and I'm just going to add in there, Larry. I mean, Roman Road, you know, I grew up learning that in church. It's great. But I think these days, Larry, with the lack of biblical knowledge and where the world is headed, we almost need to extend the road a little bit <laughs> by, uh, by, by making it clear what these passages mean, who they address, and what these terms are that are used. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you got to be careful there again gift evangelism, you got to talk the language of non-Christians. You know, I would never say non-Christian, have you heard of the Romans Road? Because the answer is no. Uh, even when I'm speaking, if I refer to biblical character, I don't assume people know who that is. I don't care if it's Nicodemus, Zacchaeus. I'll say one time, I don't care if it's the first person God created, Adam. I'll say the first person God ever created, his name was Adam. You can't assume people know that. And then one reason people like our bad news, good news approach should have end out. It's because anyone can identify bad news, good news. But the point is, be careful you're talking the language that they have. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking of a central verse there in the Roman road. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Many today don't know who Jesus Christ is, and if they did, it, it, it's not the truth about Jesus. They don't know about sin. They don't know how wages work here. They don't know about the type of death we're talking about, Larry. We just have to unpack this stuff in a way that meets people where they are. I use the illustration to support that, David. My mentor, Hattie Robinson, was one time on a plane. Somebody found out he was a professor of seminary and said it was Christmas season. And he said to Dr. Robinson, he said, I've heard that Christmas and Christ are related. I don't understand how. Could you explain that to me? Well, that's a pretty good illustration. I mean, who would not know Christmas and Christ are related? My answer is a lot of people. And therefore, you cannot assume that the same place are coming from 50 years beforehand. All right, we got a lot more questions coming in. So uh, another one is, does a person need all six characteristics in order to qualify as having the gift? Or will, in this case, they're asking, uh, will four out of the six work? <laughs> Good question. I don't think they have to have all the characteristics. But I would argue that in some way, there's all six characteristics are there. Some might be more prominent than others. But I would argue that in some way, they're probably being too critical of themselves. I think all six are there. It's just that some are more prominent than others. Okay. And, uh, and someone just commented on the last uh, poll question there, saying, hey, none of the selections for the poll question uh, seem to fit me. And, and they're just commenting, just saying, I just cry that I don't see people coming to Christ. And do you think that's indicative, possibly, of, of the gifts? Possibly, maybe? Or what do you think? Well, when people say, I just cry, I don't see people come to Christ, I would really wish I could talk with you and explain to you and ask you, what do you mean by that? It's because you're not sharing the gospel enough? because you can't share the gospel consistently without sooner or later seeing somebody respond? Or is it because you just uh, share Christ and they don't respond? Remember, God holds you responsible for faithfulness, not fruitfulness. And just because you see nobody respond, that should not discourage you. Because sometimes you can go weeks on end without having somebody respond. All of a sudden, then somebody does. And so be careful how far you carry that. Okay. Another question that came in is, uh, I'm a stay-at-home mom who desires to evangelize, but don't know how, when I'm a full-time mom, how can I begin to evangelize? Great question. Uh, I would say, take a moment sometime, sit down and think, what contacts do I have, even as a stay-at-home mom? Now, you know, words, you still go to the grocery store, you still go on errands or something else with your kids, what contacts do I have? I would venture to say you're overlooking some contacts. Then once you look at those contacts, even as a stay-at-home mom, say, what ways can I use evangelize? Sometimes it's something so simple as a letter. You can write a letter to someone that you got to know, you got their address, and share the gospel with them, and a phone call can be arranged. Be careful not to limit God. Just because you're not out among the public as much does not mean whether through a letter, through a phone call, whatever, you could still be used evangelism. But you start by saying, okay, I've got my limitations, but what contacts do I have? All right, Larry. Um, I'm looking at a question here. Brock shared his screen with me. And, and Jason here has, has asked, 
any news on when to book the three minute window will be available for purchase and somehow jason got some inside information about your upcoming book um, but i'm going back to a place in the webinar where you talked about using the gift of teaching in your sermons in order to share the gospel or make weave the gospel in it larry go ahead and give us a couple of minute preview of this upcoming book and how it fits with this and answering jason's question i think i know who jason is <laughs> The three minute window is coming out in the next three to four weeks and 52 ways to present the gospel in any message. Years ago, what got me started, a pastor said to me, when you're talking to Christians, you are so smoothly bringing the gospel. And I think it's because of your gift. I wish you'd tell us how to do it. I really got burdened of the Lord to write down 52 different ways to present the gospel in any message you give. Doesn't matter if you're talking about money, parenting, discouragement, happiness, marriage, whatever it is, 52 different ways. So the title is the three minute window, 52 ways to communicate the gospel in any message. And it'll be coming out within the next three to four weeks and be released even at the uh, Southern Baptist convention coming up in June. But uh, pastors are already telling me, Cal, can I get a copy of it? And it gives you all it's in the back. There's two indexes. One is a scripture index. Uh, using different scriptures, how you can do it, but even the different presentation I give, actually there's several scriptures you can use with it. Then what will be more hel helpful than that is a subject he heading, subject index. If you're speaking on marriage, uh, again, parenting, discouragement, work, uh, loneliness, you go to that heading and find out where there's a three minute window under that heading. But it's probably, I forget now how many headings it is, but many, many different headings and 52 ways to print the gospel in any message you give and you simply put it on your desk and use it week after week decide which one is best for this sunday and again we weren't planning on talking about this larry but just curious do you feel like the book not only benefits pastors but perhaps sunday school teachers or even people that study the bible where they can use some of these things in conversations they have yeah i think it could benefit anyone who teaches in a small group not just a pastor get a social pastor, but even in one-to-one -one conversations. For example, if you're speaking on a depression, well, you can use that in a one-to-one -one conversation as much as you can in a sermon. So very definitely. So although it's directed to pastors and church leaders, uh, I think it's go use is going to be much broader than that. But I'm really pleased with the interest we're getting already. All right, we got one last comment here that's, that's uh, just kind of asking if you agree or disagree. And it says, I think evangelism is more caught than taught. I've been through several courses on how to evangelize, but I didn't actually take students out to do evangelism in the field. Without on-the-job training, classroom teaching is only half the equation. Do you agree or disagree? It's got to be caught and taught. It's not either or, it's both and. It's got to be caught because I can go out with you, but at the same time, even alongside of going out with you and everything, teach me some things you've learned. And the people I've helped most in evangelism, I can honestly say it was caught and taught. I don't think it's either or, I think it's both ends. Because you can teach it, but at the same time, I want to go out with you and learn how to do it. Same time, I can go out with you and learn how to do it, but if you're not teaching me at the same time, aside from our going out times, I'm going to be limited in what I learn. It's got to be caught and taught. Okay, well with that, that's going to wrap us up for today. I want to uh, just uh, let everyone know about an offer we have right now, a great book that kind of accompanies, follows up very nicely with this, a devotional we have called 31 Days to Contagious Living. It's a one-month devotional that really just revitalizes not only your faith, but your desire to, to reach others and have a contagious lifestyle and sharing Jesus. We have an on-sale right now. If you visit Evangel.com, org slash webinar dash offer it'll take you right to the book it's discounted uh i don't forget the price off the top of my head but i think it's only about five dollars and so so definitely check that out and that offer is only available for just a few days so go to that, that go to the website maybe get it for yourself or uh, for someone else friend or family member and also we have upcoming uh webinars in june and july uh and next month, we'll, we're going to do a webinar on how to live out your faith in a cancel culture. This is something that people have just been very interested in, especially in the last year or so when cancel culture has been more of a term that you hear more and more and more. Well, how does it affect uh, how we live our faith? How does it affect our evangelism? And then, uh, so definitely tune in for that. 
And then lastly, I just want to say, you can find us at fantel.org, uh, head to our website, uh, and you'll find lots of evangelism training. You'll find online training. You'll find videos that you can see for, for training. You'll find lots of blogs that we have. You'll find encouragement. You'll find tips for sharing your faith. And there's just lots of great content uh, that you're going to find that will help you in your journey to share Christ more effectively. And very lastly, to go back to what we talked about on a three-minute window, uh, we are actually going to uh, have that at the Southern Baptist Convention, correct? Okay, yeah, so so at the Southern Baptist Convention later in June, uh, we'll, we'll be releasing uh, that book. You can look for announcements on our website. If you're going to uh, SBC 2021, definitely uh, stop by and see us, and uh, we'll, we'll have that book there, and uh, Dr. Moore will be there as well. Uh, with that, we want to thank you guys for attending today. And we hope everyone has a wonderful uh, rest of the week.